Hello, everyone. Uh, this is uh, the fifth of the COVID-19 uh, Conversations in International Development, hosted by the Department of Development Studies here at SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Uh, this is a, a particularly special uh, session for us to host because it features our uh, esteemed colleague, uh, Thomas Marwa, and his co-editors of what seems like a very important book, uh, that we are launching in this session, Public Banks and COVID-19, Combating the Pandemic with Public Finance. Uh, as we know, COVID-19 has been devastating uh, in terms of the economic blow that it has landed across the world. Uh, and from what I gather about this book, uh, mm -hmm. we shall obviously hear far more about it. Uh, here we have uh, essays that are looking at the role of uh, public banks in the fight against COVID and in the process of recovery to come. Uh, as the authors say, public banks provide supportive credit, fiscal assistance, expert advice, and macroeconomic stability in ways that private financial institutions are often unable or unwilling to do. Uh, this book also has a number of case studies and uh, we will obviously be hearing more about those case studies uh, for the rest of the afternoon. Uh, before I hand you over to Professor David MacDonald, who will be chairing this session, uh, let me just, uh, you know, say a, a couple of words in terms of, uh, you know, the next session, which is going to be the 8th of December, slightly different time, uh, you know, and they will be having Paolo Gerbaudo from King's College, who is going to be speaking on forms of protest uh, in the time of COVID-19. Uh, so please do look out for a notice on that one. Uh, by way of a short introduction to Professor David MacDonald, uh, David is a professor at the Department of Global Development Studies at Queen's University in Kingston in Canada. Uh, he's written extensively on private and public service delivery, uh, especially water, electricity and healthcare. And he's been uh, interested in issues of urbanization, environment and uneven development and on these themes, he has worked with partners in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and Europe. So I'm going to hand over to you uh, now, David, and I will basically take on the function now of uh, letting in people as and when they uh, appear like they're ready to be let in from the waiting room. So uh, please let me uh, hand this over to you, David. Thank you, Sabir, and welcome, everybody. Um, Sabir, I'm just wondering if you, if you haven't already, if you could make me a co-host so that I'm able to share my um, screen with people. Uh, yes. Great. Um, yeah, the, the only reason I want to show you the screen when that's up and, and running is I want to show you as well the website that we set up for this, uh, for this project. And uh, I'll just make a sort of general background to uh, where this book came from and, and how it's come about. Um, Tom and I and, um, and Diana was involved as well, uh, and some others were in, in the process of uh, talking about looking at public banks specifically as they have been playing a role in funding public water provision. And this is part of uh, the Municipal Services Project, um, which uh, if you Google municipalservicesproject.org, you can find all of our material. Uh, we do a lot of work on uh, what we call sort of good public services. Uh, how do we know they're good? Are they reproducible in other places, et cetera? And so uh, for me, at least, public banks is, is the most recent sort of look at, uh, at, at a, you know, yet another public utility. And um, Tom and, and others have been working on these a lot longer than I have. So I'm, I'm relatively new to the public bank terrain. But when COVID hit, uh, the field work we had planned for this work on public banks and public water obviously came to a crashing halt. And we thought, well, why don't we put out a call to see if anyone would be interested, willing, and able to write about um, the response of public banks and public water operators to COVID-19. And uh, somewhat to our surprise, we got a huge uh, positive response. Uh, we've just released the book on public water and COVID-19, which you can find on the MSP website. And today we're launching this one on uh, public banks and COVID-19. And uh, I'll just see now if I can uh, share my screen and take you to, here we go. Um, so this is the uh, publication page for the, uh, for the website, this brand new website we've set up. 
and you can download the entire book here. Um, and then below that, we have all of the individual chapters. And these are all uh, freely available and uh, you can download whatever interests you. I will say we've organized the book uh, as an eclectic, in an eclectic ordering. And that's in part because in the end, as you can imagine in the midst of a pandemic, uh, having the same kind of consistency across chapters was, was much more difficult than if we'd had months and months to plan this thing out and, uh, and do all the editing, et cetera. So, um, but in the end, I think that kind of eclecticness is part of the book's strength because it reveals a kind of a certain kind of universality of public banks, uh, but also highlights their, their differences. And that's also reflected, I think, in, in the eclecticness of the contributors. Uh, it's, it's a very broad mix of people, different backgrounds, different orientations, et cetera. So, um, so if you're not familiar with public banks, I think it's a great introduction to what public banks are about. Uh, and if you have been working on public banks for a long time, it, it's, I think, a fascinating uh, excursion into the variegated terrain of what public banks are. And I say that it's the, sort of the good, the bad, and the ugly um, of, of public banking. There's some really positive story. There's some problematic stories. Um, but that's exactly what, what we wanted to do, was to just try and, and, and look at how public banks are responding to COVID-19. And of course, uh, as a kind of rapid response project, it is by definition a snapshot in time. Um, and uh, all of the work basically took place between uh, May and, uh, and September. Um, so uh, things are, uh, obviously it's a very dynamic uh, issue and things are changing. So this is by no means the final word in what public banks are doing in the response to COVID-19. Uh, and uh, I think that we're going to see more of uh, public bank engagement. Um, but I'll just make one last point here. Uh, the landing page for the website uh, has a whole bunch of um, uh, smaller profiles of public banks. And if you click on any one of these uh, banks, you will be taken in and uh, you can learn about um, so this is Marathi's bank, for example, and there'll be a short profile on what that particular bank has been doing. Uh, you can also uh, search by banks, and we have 60 uh, public banks sort of randomly selected to give us a broad cross-section of geographic locations, sizes of banks, different types of banks. Um, and then if you want to learn a little bit more about public banks in general, um, we have a, a little bit of information about uh, the background to the work, but also what are public banks. Um, and uh, this, this will be interesting to some people. Uh, the field is so relatively new that there, there really isn't any consensus on even how many public banks there are. Um, and this is, this is drawing a lot on Tom's work, and I'll just flag a forthcoming book he has with Cambridge University Press in the new year, uh, which I think will be a, a kind of definitive statement qualitatively and quantitatively on public banks. Um, and as you can see here, uh, they are major players. And again, if you're not familiar with public banks, um, it's uh, a lot of people are kind of surprised, if not shocked, to learn just how uh, significant public banks are uh, around the world. So, um, yeah, that's the public banks. Uh, COVID19.org is the website, and you can get the short profiles as well as uh, download the entire book or, uh, or individual chapters. Okay, um, I think that's all I have to say. I'm going to um, uh, keep the speakers moving. We have uh, three speakers um, and they're gonna speak for about eight minutes each, kind of keep it short and sweet. Uh, and then we'll, we'll open it up for questions and, and comments. Um, if you want to put things in the chat, I will uh, forward either forward those to the uh, speakers when we're done, or it looks like we can also have people just directly ask questions. Um, so you can either signal to me with a hand wave in the, the little function on there, uh, if you wanna speak and ask a question or you can put it in the chat line and, um, and I'll make sure that the, uh, the speakers get those questions. So uh, we're gonna go in the order that, uh, that it's listed, um, Tom, Diana and, and Marie Jose. Um, and so I'll just introduce Tom first uh, briefly. Um, as many of you know, Tom's a senior lecturer of development studies at SOAS. 
and uh, as of today, I believe, uh, has uh, just started as a senior research fellow in patient finance and banking at University College London Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. Uh, he's also an, a research associate with the Municipal Services Project uh, and uh, widely published on, on public banks. And as I mentioned, uh, a book coming out in the new year with Cambridge University Press on, uh, on public banks as well. So Tom, I'll hand it over to you. Great. Thanks a lot, David. Um, I think today it gives me an enormous amount of pleasure to speak about public banks. It's something I've been working on for quite a long time. And it's great to see that now all of a sudden, uh, you know, it, it's, it's receiving the attention that it has, uh, you know, building on the, the Finance and Common Conference that was just at the beginning, middle of November, put on by uh, or hosted or ran largely by one of our contributing uh, contributors, uh, Professor Stephanie Griffith-Jones, and they've done a lot of work through the French Development Agency uh, on development banks in particular, and, and that's, you know, raised the profile of public banks, public development banks, both in the context of COVID, but in green transitions. Uh, my function here today is I want to basically introduce this world of public banks. Uh, not everybody's necessarily that familiar with what they are or even how to define it. So I, I sort of want to set out this larger context of how I've been thinking about it, how we sort of approach this book at a fairly general level, uh, and then, you know, hopefully leading forward to the discussion uh, on, on what's to be done with public banks in the future. And so one of the things that's tricky or troubling in this, this literature is what are public banks? And so we've worked around with the definition of public banks, or have been, and in the book we, we, we discussed this is what qualifies a bank as a public bank. And that really begins uh, to, to the first sort of element of that is then locating it within the public sphere. A bank is, is public if it's located in there. But how do you do that? And so we've thought about that this includes uh, by controlling, defining a public bank, by uh, controlling public ownership by a government or a public agency or some other public or uh, authority. Uh, but it could also be located in the public sphere by a legally binding public mandate, uh, or it can be set out in public law that has specific public missions or, or, or roles. Um, and it can also be significantly located within the public sphere simply by having some form of governing authority or public representation on the board. So any one of these or combination of these factors, ownership, law, mission, representation can locate a bank within the public sphere. And that's the beginning way to define it as, as a public bank. So it's not simply ownership, but it can be a combination of factors. And then these public banks have perform some form of financial intermediation, banking functions, but they do not necessarily have any innate purpose or innate function. These are really very much defined. And I'm gonna speak on this as I go along here in a second. And what we also find in my own research, but also in this book, is that public banks both function in the public interest, but they can also function in the private interest. There's, no, again, no innate goal or orientation to these banks, but they're, they're, they, they, they vary. And that means the public banks are both, they're, they're credible institutions insofar as they persist over time in both public and private interest, but they're contested and evolving. And so this is what I begin to sort of define and argue as a dynamic view of public banks. That there's no essential or necessary public orientation to it or private, no essential or necessary mandate or profit-driven purpose, and not even necessarily public dominant public ownership. But a, ma a number of factors can combine to define a bank as public. And this, you know, it, it might it sort of counters much of the sort of dominant narrative out there, but it opens up a more complicated and realistic and qualitative understanding of what a public bank is. Um, building that sort of general notion then of public bank, I just want to, there's a few things I want to emphasize about here, building on this idea. First and foremost, as David sort of mentioned at the beginning and showed on, on the website, is that they're pervasive. That public banks go back centuries, in some cases, to the 15th, 16th century. Uh, that presently there are nine, at least 910 public banks. And when we're talking about public banks in this book and in our own work, we're not just talking about development banks, but we're including development, 
commercial retail banks, so like your HSBC type thing, but also universal banks that combine commercial and retail. So when we're talking about 910 pu public banks, it's a combination of these institutions. And many of these are decades, 80, 90, 100, 150 year old types of institutions. So they've been around for a long, long time. And many of them, there's a number of new ones being created now following the wave of privatization in the 1980s. These public banks are not only pervasive, but they're powerful. They have combined among these 900 institutions, 910 institutions, nearly $49 trillion in combined assets. But in addition to this monetary resource that they hold within the public sphere, they also have an enormous legacy of built up and acquired knowledge, uh, capacity, expertise, and so on, that, that sort of feeds into them and, and informs what they do for better and, and sometimes for worse. That means that they're capable, that they've, these institutions are already engaged across the economic and political and social sphere at the both national and international scales. They're confronting the grand challenges like COVID-19, but also the, the, the coming challenges in terms of uh, decarbonization, definancialization, and democratization. And Diana's going to speak more on their specific COVID-19 functions in a moment. But public banks, and we must not forget, are always contested. They are contested political institutions. They are institutions of finance and of finance capital within capital. And they're pulled between contending public and private interests. They are, they are highly contested because of the resources they control and because of their being located within class divided society. It can't be otherwise. So in that sense, when we're thinking about specific cases of public banks in the global north, in the global south, we should think of them as the resultants of actions of social forces. They are the combined result and they're evolving both at the individual and collective. Level. And this is why when I talk about public banks, I, I talk about them as dynamic institutions. They evolve. There is no direct correlation between them, their public ownership and any necessary public orientation. They're, they have no timeless or teleological purpose. It varies so much that we, 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 we have to understand them as changing institutions. And they're, they are dynamic because of the social forces that make and remake these, these public banks. So they're often contradictory. And we see this in the book in terms of their COVID-19 responses. Uh, but we, you can see this, we can see this in terms of their, their coming rules and decarbonization and definancialization. They're not essentially bad or good. They're pulled. But what, we, what's, what they do do and how they function uh, you know, they, they're a sort of reflection of the, of the wider social forces. And that makes them complex uh, institutionalized social relations, relationships that, that might on one side be, be funding decarbonization, but on the other side, they might well be promoting the a highly carbonized form of industrialization. To wrap up then, when we're thinking about these public banks as, as complex beings, we should be thinking of this as a very positive, but also hopeful orientation because they change, they're open to change. They can be made in a better image. And as, uh, as a number of CSOs are talking about, we can build forward better with them. We can make them better and we can command them better. This is something I think MJ is going to speak a little bit on near the end. Um, but I don't want, and I don't think I overstep when I say everybody on this panel and, and the contributors to the book, we're all committed to ensuring and pushing through our own intellectual labors, through our own advocacy, through our own work. We're all committed to pushing public banks toward have, towards having a far more socially equitable pro-public, green and just orientation. And that this is something we would like to see evolve out of what they've been doing and reacting and responding to in the context of COVID-19. And this is an enormous opportunity for us to really capture and shape the agenda and the future of public banks, given their massive financial and sort of expertise and technical legacy. Thank you. Great, thank you, Tom. Okay, uh, we'll move on to our second speaker, uh, Diana Baraclau. Diana is a senior economist at the uh, UN Commission on Trade and Development. 
uh, co-author of the uh, UNCTAD's annual uh, Trade and Development Report and leads UNCTAD's research on development finance and industrial policy. And Diana, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Um, so first of all, uh, hello everyone. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, my task in the next uh, eight minutes is to try and give a, a snapshot of some of our findings. And um, obviously I can't possibly do justice to the full 22 chapters and the, and the 60 bank profiles. It's, each one is incredibly rich. So I want just to try and, and give a, a flavor of a few, uh, a few key issues. Um, so the first thing I wanted to um, start thinking about is the way that COVID and the public bank responses has served to undermine and uh, help throw away at least five myths or illusions with regard to public finance. The first is this idea that the cupboard is bare. Okay, our case studies show that the cupboard is not bare, we can fill it. And in fact, public banks have played a major role in filling the cupboard. It's not true that we need to save money before we can spend it. Public banks have showed that they are credit creators as well as mediators of credit. It's not necessarily true that public debt should not be over some pre-subscribed uh, proportion of GDP. What we're seeing in these months is that people are, are realizing the denominator matters too, and public banks are seen as a way of addressing that. The idea that central banks must only do a very narrow role of inflation targeting has been questioned in a major way um, in the last few months. And particularly maybe the idea that private investors can be harnessed to save the day and that the, private, the public sector does not have the capacity for what is needed. I think that has really been questioned. And I, in fact, forget about questioned. I think we've really shown that public banks have emerged as the dynamic financial institutions that are capable of responding to what their societies need right now. And so our question as we move forward is, you know, how do we support them to be better? And this is a, uh, an issue that, um, that MJ will be addressing after me, and I hope we'll be able to discuss this as the, as the, you know, when the speakers are finished as we go through the discussion. Um, in our introduction to the book, we pick up on five key lessons that we got from our various case studies. And I just want to address those very quickly. The five key lessons, because I'm going to try and share my screen, do this for you, make it a bit more interesting. Where did I lose? Oh, I just lost it. Here we go. So uh, why, why public banks matter? So let's look at the bottom half of this um, slide, the five promising lessons from, that we find of all the case studies. And the first is that rapid response is possible. The public banks responded incredibly rapidly in country after country around the globe. And you can trace this starting in January with the People's Bank of China. From January 31, in fact, is the day that we start seeing a major push from the People's Bank of China followed through with Chinese policy banks. We see uh, big follow throughs with um, all the Asian banks lending on a very large scale, often doubling the offer within weeks when they realize there's excessive demand for what is needed. In March, we see the central banks of the advanced countries, the, the US Fed has pumped $4 trillion into the economy within a matter of uh, two months after March, slashed interest rates rapidly within a matter of weeks, dramatic increase in lending. So rapid response is possible and we see it across all the public institutions. We see the importance of having public purpose mandates. They're absolutely key. The idea that banks are uh, able and in fact expected to act differently from other banks in the financial system. And we saw that where banks had a very clear public purpose, they could be most unambiguous in their support. So some banks were able to lend directly to local governments, for example. Others were mandated to lend to sectors. We saw um, banks mandated to lend to SMEs or to tourism or agriculture. Um, sometimes local governments. We also see examples where public banks have got a more difficult 
path where the mandate is ambiguous or unclear in countries with long histories of public banking, but then change direction to, to a, a different profile. We saw that in uh, the case studies on public banks in Turkey, India and Mexico, for example, showed that quite clearly that the history was not able to be reproduced and the banks were not able to support their government national goals. Um, we have uh, um, other examples where there's a, a, a strong link between the public mandate, for example, to support um, investments in climate change and the mandate to support COVID. There are some quite interesting parallels there. A third lesson that comes out from all the case studies is about boldness and generosity and how this is absolutely <laughs> essential when facing a crisis. So historically, we had very good examples of this with the Great Depression and President Roosevelt. And again, with the Marshall Plan in post-World War II, these were bold, large scale, fast and generous responses. You don't hold back and try and do teaspoons with what is needed as buckets. And we've seen examples of this from all of the banks. And, and in fact, uncut estimates um, for, glo for global growth over the next year is that we're wiping out 4% of GDP or $6 trillion worth of wealth in the global economy. And this is unprecedented. So we really see that these bold and generous responses are absolutely essential. The fourth uh, lesson that we got from our comparative case studies, which is very promising, is the importance of history and institutional capacity. And we saw that in the cases where public banks had been around for some time already, and they've got already lines of communication with the rest of the financial sector or with their users or indeed with their government owners, um, these banks were able to respond quickly and you know, get straight to the point because they have well-honed channels already of expertise and working. Um, so you can't build this up overnight. Having said that, countries that don't have all the public banks they need, you know, this is a good chance to get started because you'll be better prepared for the next crisis. Um, in some of our examples with the public banks, for example, that were um, multilateral public banks, we see very quick responses back with national banks because they've got regular um, institutional arrangements for conversation and discussion and for uh, channeling funds and expertise. The fifth lesson is the importance of solidarity and particularly public-public solidarity. We saw many examples of these, this benefits of a non-competitive and collaborative solidarity between public banks, between public banks and government, between financial institutions and users. Um, we have examples where, for example, some sovereign wealth funds were using um, the COVID crisis as an opportunity to seed fund development banks or to lend to local governments. We see central banks lending to local governments or financing local government needs. And then we see South-South um, solidarity. Um, the, the Latin American Reserve Fund, for example, FLA, within weeks has doubled its lending capacity by borrowing internationally to meet the needs of its member states. And, and this is a, a you know, one country, one vote institution, so solidarity driven. Um, in terms of the functions of the banks, we saw that um, we saw that uh, public banks can face a wide variety, wide variety of um, actions and functions. So in the 22 case studies that you see in the book, we have examples of many different capacities of public banks and, and how they're distinctive. They can be, they, can they be distinctive if they have the mandate is, the, is um, a question that we ask, but this is what they are trying to do is um, boosting liquidity through quantitative easing or massive bond, asset bond purchases, lending particularly to sectors or households in great need, grant lending, this is something really different for public banks that you can lend on extremely favorable terms that commercial banks can't do. We saw regulatory support where central banks are changing the regulations of the financial sector to, to support the commercial banks in their needs to support households and firms. There's a whole list here that I don't have time to go through, but I hope that just the flavor of this encourages you to read all the chapters in the book. Um, something else that we did see in the- um, Sorry, the Diana, I'm going to, uh, just going to give you a 30 second warning there. 
Hey, you didn't show me the two minute sign. Oh, I did. You didn't see it. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I must have, sorry, wrong glasses. <laughs> really, I didn't see that. Um, okay, so, well, I'll, I'll stop with this. The, just can I have a minute for this side? Yes. Slide yeah. But what we did see is um, very importantly that not all countries and not all banks have the same space to react in. And this may be up, it's partly to do with mandate and it's also to do with obviously wealth and currency and many issues. But what we see is that in the advanced economies, they really were able to pull out uh, all the stops. And we have um, stimulus responses that are 40 to 50% of GDP. By comparison, we have the um, developing countries of the world that are trying to make do with responses, you know, that are measured in single, single digits and some obviously even less. So um, I'm, going to, I'm going to stop there. And if we have a chance, we can continue in discussion later. Thank you. Great. If you could just take your uh, share screen uh, function off there, sure. Diana. I Great. really didn't Thanks. see the sign. Are you sure you did that? <laughs> it was there. That's okay. That's okay. Um, yeah, before we go into the next speaker, I just want to, some of, us, some of you have just joined us. We're, we're halfway through, uh, well, two thirds of the way through our speaker presentations. We have, we have one more and then we'll open it up for, uh, for questions and, uh, and answers. Um, just wanted to underscore that point, uh, you know, that about public, public solidarity. And that's something we're interested in is not just sectoral publicness, but, you know, how do public banks interact with public water operators, with public health care operators? And, you know, banks tend to think because private financiers think they're, you know, semi-gods, semi that there's something unique about finance. Uh, there's nothing unique about finance. It is a public utility and, and can be and should be a public utility. So I think it's important for us to, you know, see it as any other public institution. And uh, that sort of connectedness between uh, public banks and, and other public uh, service providers uh, is, is a really important part of understanding what that public mission is and what public public solidarity looks like. And that's, uh, that's something we'll be we'll re restarting with our work on uh, how public banks interact with uh, public water operators. Okay, uh, we'll move on to our third and final presentation. Uh, Maria Jose Romero is, uh, importantly, a PhD candidate in development economics at uh, SOAS, uh, the host for today's event. Uh, she's also the policy and advocacy manager in development finance at the European Network on Development, uh, sorry, Debt and Development, uh, Eurodebt. And uh, Maria Jose, I'll hand it over to you. And I'll, I see you're muted. There you go. Yes, um, thank you very much, David. Uh, good afternoon and good morning to everyone that is with us. I know that there are colleagues from the other side of the Atlantic, in, including David. Uh, so it's, it's a great pleasure to be with you all today. Um, I will share my screen um, to share some slides with you. Um, first thing to say is that Eurodad is a network of um, 49 civil society organizations uh, working on issues related to development finance in uh, 20 uh, countries around Europe. And we work with partners from North and South on, on these um, specific um, issues. And um, the issue of public development banks had been um, on the agenda of Eurodad for um, at least um, a couple of years. So it's not that, um, that is new to this debate as a result of, of COVID. Um, and this is what I will try to share with you today in my 10 minutes uh, or, or, or less. Um, so why civil society has been interested uh, uh, and has been working on public development banks, some of the challenges that we identify in the chapter um, that is included in the book, um, and some of the um, arguments um, that we also include in, in, in our chapter on the need to reclaim public development banks on the basis of core features that uh, form um, a reform uh, agenda that we want to promote. Um, I will summarize here our main, um, 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 our main points because I think that quite a lot has been said by, by David, Tom and Diana. Um, I think that um, um, there is a lot of potential uh, on public development banks. 
um, their, their, the experience shows that um, historically they have played a key role. Um, their response to the COVID-19 that Diana mentioned also shows the same. But uh, from a civil society uh, perspective, um, we have been very interested in um, understanding um, why there has been so much emphasis on um, the role of existing multilateral development banks and not so much on other institutions like national development banks that are relevant players in promoting um, 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 uh, and in providing finance to sectors and regions um, that private financial institutions do not serve um, sufficiently. Um, while uh, there is also the case that not enough attention has been paid um, to have and to develop a development finance architecture able to deliver in, in the public interest. And in a way, uh, this together uh, with the need of developing countries to get access to finance that serve their development plans um, and serve their needs to finance the SDGs and the Paris um, Agreement um, uh, has been um, um, in um, the thought of Eurodad and many other organizations that have been engaging in, in this uh, specific conversation. When it comes to the challenges that we identify in um, the development finance architecture and some of the institutions that have played a key role um, so far, uh, what we see is that, as Tom said, we are in front of uh, institutions that have been heavily contested um, because uh, in, in many cases are institutions that um, have not performed um, their roles uh, uh, up to the standard that they should have done. Um, some institutions have been rightly questioned about the negative impact of the development model that they have promoted and their, their, their operations. In some cases, what we see is that um, there has been um, social and environmental impact, negative impact of the supported uh, projects an excessive focus on profit making and also uh, poor governance um, when it comes to these institutions. And here we talk about a uh, lack of transparency, poor accountability, um, uh, um, also a lack of proper civil society participation, um, and also um, a problematic use of financing instruments um, and an excessive focus on supporting private financial institutions and, and also um, a neoliberal agenda um, in, in some of their uh, policies and, and, and the projects uh, favored by these institutions. Um, so um, as, as um, Tom also um, said, what we have seen is that the, the potential role of most public development banks has been squeezed towards uh, private interest over and above the, the, the public interest. And uh, importantly, in our analysis of the responses of um, some of these institutions, uh, what we see is some of these challenges have not gone away with the uh, pandemic, and some might be even uh, uh, intensified. So there is a need there to um, actually um, analyze um, in, in, in what terms they are uh, providing their, their response to, to COVID. And here we, we go to um, our main message that is that the, uh, there is a need to reclaim uh, public development banks. And I will emphasize here the point on the development mandate of, of these institutions, because um, as um, we have heard, there is a, um, 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 a wide range of institutions that can be under the label of public banks. And here, um, from our point of view, it's very important to um, emphasize that um, uh, there is a, a need um, also to reclaim and to focus on public development banks. And um, as, um, as we um, have heard, um, public institutions um, 
have performed um, uh, in, in, in such a rapid way in response to the, to the crisis that, um, that the role of the state and the role of public institutions have been reinforced uh, by, by the pandemic. There is a need to um, um, uh, stress the important role of, of the state in response to the pandemic. So it is key to reclaim uh, public banking for the public interest and it's also key to um, have a conversation on, on uh, what would be the right type of finance um, and um, what would be the right type of institutions. Uh, because it's clear that the private commercial financial sector is unlikely on its own to provide the finance, the, the finance needed uh, to support uh, countries to get out of the of the of the crisis, the challenges that they, they are facing are, are huge. So um, um, uh, the the key question on the what type of institutions and also for what development model is is a question that we think that this book helps to um, um, answer. Um, and here we go to the core features of a model public development bank that um, uh, are part of a reform agenda that we, that we want to promote. Uh, and we have um, identified four key pillars for these um, core features, and they are the mandate, the strategy, the sustainability um, uh, of, of the institution, and also the governance. And here I am trying to summarize them. Um, in, in, in terms of uh, these core features, but there are more in a, in a dedicated table that is included in, the, in, in our book chapter. Um, here, it's very important, as, um, uh, as Tom and Diana mentioned, the issue of um, uh, having a strong development mandate and a strong policies dedicated to serve this particular mandate. And here we are talking about the SDGs, the Paris Agreement, etc. Um, high social and environmental standards, including human rights, labor, gender equality standards, have to be included there. Uh, there is a role also, um, um, and there is a need for um, a specific policies that guide the, um, the work of uh, public development banks to provide stable and long-term uh, counter-cyclical finance. Um, there is also a need to have an adequate business model. And by this, we mean a careful choice of the funding of these institutions and the, the, the method uh, of investing the, the money. Uh, and this goes hand in hand with internal systems to focus their operations, um, to assess their operations and to monitor the, develop, uh, the development impact of, of, of their operations. Um, Sorry, MJ, I'm just going to give you the one minute warning yes, there. It's, uh, it's called... Um, um, it's, it's close to the end. So here I will emphasize um, as a final point, the good governance, because um, as we have discussed before, there is a need to democratize existing institutions um, because without this governance pillar, we will be lacking um, um, a critical part of how their operations are set and um, um, the, the ones that benefit from, from, from their operations as well. And finally, the adequate articulation between the different levels, the global, the regional, and the national level of these institutions. This is a discussion that have not been um, um, emphasized uh, enough and from our uh, perspective is a, is a critical discussion. So I will conclude by saying that these institutions have a key role to play, can play this role and should play this, this role um, uh, in the way out of the crisis. But the mandate, the policies and the operations of these institutions have to be changed for them to deliver in, in the public interest. And here to conclude, I will make a reference to the Financing Common Summit, which was a recent gathering of um, over 450 institutions. Um, and um, as a result of this gathering, they issue a um, um, joint declaration uh, where they mentioned that they, um, they, they set a global coalition of public development banks 
Um, here, the point to make is that um, there was quite um, a lot of good language, good, good intentions, uh, good commitment in this statement. Um, so I think that in the coming months, words have to be put into action for these institutions to actually serve the very good intentions that they put in their declaration. And civil society organizations and academic, as it is the, the, the gathering today, have the opportunity to actively contribute to, to this debate. Uh, this is an urgent debate um, and we are happy to be involved in this work. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, MJ. Okay, if you could just unshare your screen there. Yes. Okay, just before we open it up to uh, uh, comments, um, I just want to, for those of you who uh, arrived late, uh, just a reminder, this is the new website we've established. I've just sent a link to it, uh, publicbankscovid19.org, where we have a, uh, a series on the landing page of small mm -hmm. profiles of public banks uh, from around the world. This is a, a sort of a random sampling of 60 banks. Uh, you'll notice I'm sitting here in Canada right at the end of the Great Lakes there. We have basically no banks, public banks in North America. <laughs> uh, we do, but North Dakota is the, the lone state-owned bank in the States, and we have a few very commercially private sector-oriented banks. Uh, otherwise, in Canada, our most recent version is essentially trying to privatize our public services. Uh, but you'll see from this map, it, it is a truly global uh, phenomenon. And you can click on any of these bank profiles and search by region. And then if you go to the publications page, uh, that's where this new book is. And you can download the entire book or individual chapters. So uh, we encourage you to, uh, to do that and, uh, and help us get the word out uh, on that front. Okay. Um, so I want to jump in for a second if I could. Yeah. Before, just before we go to the, the, the questions and comments and you know, feel free to post them in the chat or if you want to do it, I think we can go orally as well. But I just wanted to make a quick point and just to emphasize that this, the importance of, of public banks in the context of COVID-19, just sort of drawing some of the comments Diana and, and, and Aguilar would say, that it, the, in the initial response, it really was about providing liquidity and providing it very, very quickly to governments, households, families, businesses, and so on. And to think of this conceptually, it's, it's important to think the banks were literally making time available for people to get through the worst of the crisis, governments, families, and so on. And so it, 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 they have to match that public capacity with the financial capacity at times of emergencies and be commanded to do so. It's and it's not a profit-oriented orientation. That much of this was simply done at a loss or using returns that banks were making at other times to sort of underwrite the losses of, of this time. And it's and it's and we have we cannot underestimate the, the significance of that and link that to the importance of having this capacity on hand to face these, these challenges in the future, both in terms of emergencies like COVID, but also in terms of climate change, in terms of social challenges, inequality, and so on. And, uh, and hence why it's so important to build a very progressive and, and organized campaign around reclaiming and, and claiming public banks for, for the public good and the pro-public orientation. And hence the importance of those looking at those existing public-public collaborations that Diana was talking about, and how you can combine resources. Because if you begin to combine public financial resources, you're actually magnifying this 49 trillion closer to 90 trillion dollars in assets. And then we're talking about absolutely unfathomable amounts of money that can be commanded democratically in ways that can be managed in, in, in way to reduce inequality, to overcome the challenges of COVID, to begin building aggressively towards a decarbonized economy in the future. But, and I just want, this is sort of the, the point that we haven't gotten at and we need to emphasize when we're thinking about the discussion here, is that this is gonna face a, a backlash very, very soon and a very harsh neoliberal backlash. There's going to be a demand to privatize these public banks for having done exactly what they were supposed to do, which is bail us out of this, this international global crisis
and and start you know building a sort of decarbonized green future economy it's going to face a crisis very soon so we need to have a political movement and a, a very organized political response because this is coming immediately and so i think this should be part of our discussion how do we how do we progressively think for the pro public response and have a defense ready for the for the attack we know is going to come within months if not within the next year or two in terms of demands on these public banks to be privatized uh, because of the failures, because they've been profitable at times of crisis. Okay, thank you, Tom. No, that's great. Um, so we have we have about seventy people uh, participating right now, um, and so uh, you can either put your questions in the chat box, and and I can ask those if and if you're targeting it towards one of the presenters. Uh, or if you want to somehow flag for me either turning your video on uh, and asking a very quick question, happy to do that as well. Um, I don't see any uh, hands waving at the moment. Uh, oh, there's one. Uh, Subir, why don't you uh, start us off? Yeah, I, you know, fascinating uh, discussion and I'm really looking forward to downloading everything and taking a quick look. My question really has to do with India. And I saw that even in the uh, slide, I think it was uh, Diane who showed that they had a very small percentage in terms of, uh, you know, what it is that they have been able to put forward for uh, COVID relief. And so that sort of put me in the frame of asking the following question. How much do national histories of public banks matter uh, in, the, in the sense that over the last some years, uh, the Indian public banks have been under tremendous uh, stress uh, collapses have happened, mergers have happened and so forth. And also large amounts of corporate loan write-offs have happened with respect to some of the large banks. So even before COVID hit, the capacity of uh, large public banks, uh, public sector banks would have been, you know, already kind of reduced. And connected to that is the question of the use, uh, the kind of institutional capture of uh, public banks, uh, for example, by uh, governments with large mandates who are then kind of using it for a de facto privatization. So how much variation do you see in those two things? Mm -hmm. Do one of you three speakers want to respond to that first? You're muted there, Diana. Um, I'll take a, a, a quick response, but then um, Thomas and Maria Jose, I hope you'll also add something. Um, so Subir, so thanks for picking that up. So that's the chapter by um, our colleague Chandru, who did a, a very good history of India and the public banking in India. And he makes, um, he, you know, it's a very, um, you know, he, he's a wonderful economist and it's a very, very expert history of public banking in India. In fact, private banking as well in India. And he said, he explains how after colonization, or after independence, you know, there was strong, um, movement to of strong national public banks but from the 1980s as in so many other countries too you know this was overturned and and you know that the public banks had had some of the problems that you're mentioning of course like public banks in many other places um but that you know the pendulum has gone so far in the other direction that their banks were simply unable to kind of carry the burden that the indian government wanted them to take in this covid context and and Chandru's chapter does in fact end on exactly that note that you said, which is that, you know, now these, these public banks that already were constrained in their ability to respond to, to the public need, they've taken on board all of these um, private sector debt and private sector burdens. Of course, they're struggling with that. And it's precisely the moment, this is how Chandru ends the chapter, it's precisely the moment at which they will be slated for privatization and then sold off, you know, very cheaply as well is the point that he makes. And, um, and yet this is the inevitable role of public sector finance is that it does step in when the private sector is, is in trouble. And so it's very ironic that they should be blamed for doing precisely what they're supposed to do. Um, so I'll leave it to my colleagues, okay. please. Continue. Tom or MJ? MJ, do you want to add? Yes, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Subir, for, for the question. I, I think that the question on institutional capture of public development banks is, is, is a key question. Um, and um, I could say that um, there are different um, different experiences 
uh, we can see um, um, different ways in which this institutional capture uh, plays out in the cases where, where it happens. Um, um, at the global level, we, we have the experience of the World Bank as the lead public development bank, and this has been the focus of um, your dad's work uh, for many years, together with uh, an analysis on development finance institutions from European countries. Um, and there, what we can see is that um, institutional capture uh, of, of these, in, of, 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 of these uh, uh, banks plays out at the level of the agenda that they serve, um, the, the projects that are being supported there, and also, as I emphasize, the, the governance and the, the practice that these institutions have when it comes to, to um, their, their, their policies, uh, et cetera. So um, I think that this is a risk that um, it's important to, um, um, to, to investigate and also uh, to expose when we have evidence on, on that. And I want you all to, um, to uh, go back to an article that was published in Al Jazeera uh, on Saturday last Saturday that calls for decolonizing uh, mm -hmm. the World Bank and the IMF as the lead institutions in um, the development finance architecture. Um, and of course, here we are talking about um, also, you know, public development banks working at the national level, national institutions. The dynamics there um, are um, different. But uh, with this um, thinking in mind of decolonizing institutions, I think that, and the practice of these institutions, I think that um, we have quite a lot, uh, what, quite a lot to do. Thank you. Yeah, let me, let me just add to that quickly. I don't know if there's if there's more questions coming there, David, or not. Um, uh, there's, but, a, there's a few. Why don't you take a, there's a, two more. I'll, why don't you make a quick comment and then I'll uh, uh, talk about these questions. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the question of the national histories of public banks, and I was just talking about this earlier today with some new colleagues, uh, it, it, it's so important. You can have some general visions and general ideas of, of banks and how they're going to work in different countries, but so much depends on the culture of that country, on political institutions, on existing financial practices, on the size of private banks, for God's sakes, whether they want to crush any sort of in sort of any incursion on their business in terms of public banking, which we see in the United States right now. Where, you know, there's, there's a sort of vicious backlash against the public banking movement there. Um, but the, the national history is so vital. Uh, so in the case of Germany, where there's a you know, very strong culture uh, of public and savings banks, as well as public services, there's not much of a threat to the public banks there in terms of privatization and so on. But uh, you know, in elsewhere, there, there, there's quite, you know can be quite a strong backlash, um, and that also links to the, the question of institutional capture, and so much has to do with the, the legacies of, of representation in the public banks. Is there representation? How is it legally mandated? How binding is it? Um, I don't think. I think it has very little to do with whether or not there's government representation on public banks. To be honest, some of the best you know, quote unquote, best run banks are directly run by ministers of the government, like KFW, Nordic Investment Bank. But at the same time, some of the most, you know, seemingly politically, um, let's say, insulated banks, one of our colleagues writes about Turkey, uh, are terribly abused banks, <laughs> regardless of whether they have government, they don't have any government ministers directly on the boards necessarily. Right? So it's about the histories and the cultures in which the public banks find themselves and what society commands and demands of those banks and the mechanisms built into them. So that's, when I talk about struggles over public banks, I'm talking about the struggles over the mechanisms by which we can command them to serve in some form of democratic public good and, and the means by which we can hold them accountable rather than some abstract principle where you must have fully independent board members who could simply you know, command that the banks then go fund their biggest corporate bailouts of Airbus or whatever. It's, it's, it's really about integrating means of holding banks accountable at quite a broad base, rather than abstract principles about government ministers or not, or, and so on. 
Okay, great. We've got a, a next question here I like in particular because I, with our municipal services project, we've always tried to be at the sort of cutting edge uh, academically uh, in terms of what's going on and, and rigor, uh, but then making, making that information available to uh, people on the ground, uh, labor unions, NGOs, community activists, et cetera. So this is a question from uh, New York City, the, uh, the home of private predatory finance. Um, and uh, it says, we're part of an exciting movement in, the, in New York to make public banking a reality at state and municipal levels. What do you think we should be doing to bring the message to legislators that public banks around the world are responding rapidly to COVID and other crises? And I should say that there's a quite a dynamic pro-public banking movement emerging in the United States. And there's a chapter in the book by Ellen Brown, uh, the Public Banking Institute, which you might want to have a look at. So maybe MJ, you could comment, you know, as a, as a CSO, uh, you know, how do you advise people uh, in terms of the practicalities of, of trying to push for not just any old public bank, but uh, accountable, democratic, progressive public banks? Thanks. Um, the question is very interesting. And, and I guess that uh, you have put quite a lot on my shoulders to, to respond with some tips. <laughs> uh, so what I would say is that um, it's, uh, it's important to look at public development banks and public banks in general in an holistic way. And this has been the approach that we as Eurodal have taken so far. And this is why we are talking about these four pillars. Uh, because um, in our um, uh, reading of what a civil society can do and, and, and what would be a reform agenda for these institutions or for the ones that um, um, are going to be created. Um, it's the point that um, it's not enough to look at um, um, the finance that they have available or the, the, the projects and the policies that they uh, will have to um, um, uh, provide um, uh, finance um, if they don't have the governance pillar uh, right and the and the ways of measuring that and and, and, the, and the ways of structuring their interventions to deliver uh, in in the in the public interest so um, there has been quite a lot of work um, 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 uh, conducted by civil society organizations in recent years that look at the social and environmental impact of public development banks. This is, this is a very important agenda and, and this is an agenda that we should all support because um, we are, uh, what we have seen, um, uh, it's clearly that in some cases there have been negative social and environmental impact. But without looking at these institutions in an holistic way, we will be just solving a very small part of the problem without looking at exactly the model that these institutions uh, promote and uh, what interest they, they serve and in what particular way. So if I have to, uh, um, if I have to talk to colleagues from New York uh, uh, that are uh, putting together these, these work to um, reclaim and support the public banks, I would go for this um, holistic approach uh, and I would go for uh, reinforcing the positive examples um, in response to the COVID crisis. Um, from around the world, because for sure there, there, there are good things that we have to um, uh, emphasize. Thank you. Great, thanks MJ. And I would just add to that, I think demystifying finance is, is such an important part of this that, uh, you know, uh, again, the, the sort of high finance people want us to believe there's a kind of rocket science to this, and which of course they use to then hide all kinds of crazy, uh, you know, accounting and, uh, finance mechanisms, which, you know, then serve to undermine uh, public credibility. So, you know, it, it ain't too difficult figuring out how to loan money well and creatively and progressively. Um, and we just need democratic control of these things. So I think that, you know, as a public education project, demystifying finance is, is going to be a, a really important part of, of making and reclaiming and, and uh, reimagining public banks. Uh, we have a question here uh, about um, uh, 
saying that this person is saying, what is the difference between public banks, public development banks, and development financial institutions such as the World Bank? And why are these terms used interchangeably? Um, Tom, I'll ask you maybe just to give a, a very quick summary of this. There is a discussion of this in the opening chapter of the book, uh, but uh, Tom, maybe you just want to respond quickly to that. Yeah, they've raised the hornet's nest. And <laughs> um, I mean, there's lots of different terminology. At base, we have to think that there are development banks, which typically do not accept deposits, and they tend to lend to other banks or to larger institutions or to governments, and they don't typically have a branch network like a you know a corner shop uh, on each court on street corner. Um, so that's one type, and that would be often similarly related to development finance institutions, though development finance institutions might also have different types of investment funds and so on that might just, in a sense, be an office in a government building or their own separate organization. A universal public bank is something that does that development, so it lends to organizations or institutions or to micro enterprises or to infrastructure, but at the same time, it's going to have a bank outlet on the corner street that accepts deposits. You can do checking, uh, you can do money transfers, have a mortgage or something like that. In okay, so that's quite common in the global south. You'll see quite a lot of those types of banks. And then there's some that are just pure commercial retail banks. Not that many actually. It's not that common, where the public bank is simply like a deposit taking bank where it does checking and and your regular day-to-day -day banking services, but doesn't really engage in, in uh, investment projects. So in, in the case of Canada, for example, the Alberta Treasury branch would fall along that, where it's your day-to-day -day banking institution where you would just deposit checks and get a mortgage and things like that. So there's different types of them. Um, our focus has, tend, has tended to be very inclusive, and I think it's important that we include all these types of banks. Uh, so we have brought up the case of India, because in many cases, the deposit-taking public banks will then support the development banks by channeling resources into them, for example, and then the development banks will help, will, will, will offer programs through the commercial banks. So they'll have retail out or like banks on the corner street that are more connected to communities. So in my level of my way of thinking, it's very important to think of these very holistically in terms of public-public collaborations uh, in a, a sort of holistic system. And this is very much sort of more the discussion that's going on in the U.S. of thinking about having some retail banks that are, you know, deposit taking, financial access and so on, linking to more developments, regional development banks uh, that can do more investment type projects, also linked to sort of a national bank that can access foreign or global financial capital markets at very cheap rates, and that global development bank then channeling cheap funds into the more regional and local so just to clarify for people, Tom, as well, I mean, I often get this question, is, you know, is a co-op a public bank? And I think the answer to that is no, this is a, a privately, you know, co-op owned, owned bank. So what, what role for the state? Hold on, hold on. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, it would depend. There are some cooperative publicly owned banks that are legally mm -hmm. fall under ownership, but also thinking through more qualitative understanding that some co-op or worker control banks would have formal government representation on the board and would then would have some substantive like public missions, if you will, around development or loaning or things like that. So the Banco Popular de Costa Rica in Costa Rica would qualify. Sparkas in Germany, the savings bank would qualify. And one of our guests here, Milford Bateman, I'm sure has a whole bunch of other examples he would be willing to share a contributor to the book as well in that regard. So it doesn't necessarily disqualify them as a public bank. Right, but there has to be some state engagement is what you're saying. In, in my definition of public bank, there has to be something that qualitatively situates any bank, whatever you want to call it, a bank within the public sphere, by ownership, by control, by legal mandates, something like that, that connects it to the public sphere. Right, and that can happen at the municipal level and it can happen at the global multilateral level. Yeah, yeah. They're all, they all fall under that umbrella of, of public, but then the character and ownership connectedness and the sort of democratic accountability obviously changes quite dramatically. Yeah. Okay, we had another question here about uh, uh, 
Oh, sorry, Subir, did you? Um... Yeah, I just wanted to you know, ask a quick, uh, maybe typological question. How do you folks uh, distinguish between public banks and cooperative banks or credit unions and uh, those sorts of things, which uh, are kind of, you know, obviously not private. They're, they're sort of in a different zone than the private sector. And uh, do you find any need to see how they might have contributed to things like recovery from COVID, particularly in terms of providing uh, loans to small and medium enterprises and the like. Tom, did you want to continue with that? Sure. Yeah, I mean, that was sort of just what I was talking about there, Subir, that you can have these cooperative banks that are located within the public sphere, either by ownership or representation. They played a very important role in terms of there's been a lot of debt, not, if not forgiveness, like uh, they don't have to repay their loans for several months, uh, forgiveness on interest. Um, they play a lot of roles in terms of mortgages, uh, they sort of unloaded or created a whole bunch of new services in terms of access and so So they've had a very important place in the household in terms of making time available to get through the crisis. Uh, much more so than the development banks, for example. Uh, but we, we can have a conversation about that later. But they play a very important role. They're, they're massive. We have trillions of dollars in resources, even within the co-op banks as well. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so we had a question about sectoral lending and whether there's any particular sectors that uh, that public banks have been lending to, uh, particularly with, with COVID. So, uh, you know, one of the big questions is as soon as this pandemic is over, of course, we have the next existential crisis which hasn't gone away, which is climate change. Um, where, where are we at with public bank uh, lending on uh, transformation to a, a greener transition? And, and are we seeing that as part of COVID relief packages? So if, if any of you want to respond specifically to, you know, the empirics of that, but more broadly, um, you know, what, what's, what's the, the future look like for public bank funding in, in the green transition? Diana, do you want to take a stab at that? Oh, you're, you're muted there, Diana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just trying there to unmute myself. In fact, I'm just going to show you. I've got a funny, um, a funny picture on this. Let me go. To, let me, I've got a cartoon on this, which I thought was quite funny. So, so this, is, <laughs> this was a joke on one of the um, British newspapers that you know so COVID-19 is the is like the um the small wave a painful wave and bringing us lots of uh, unhappiness and uh, destruction of the economy and deaths and but it's a small thing compared to what could be coming um and so you know getting to your question David about you know what's the link between the lending um I think this is a I think this is a very moot point and and in my reading of this is that it can it can go both ways. And one side is that you know this could be a very positive uh, way for much of the lending that people have been commenting on for years that we need for you know green and sustainable transformation. And we've we've realised that actually banks do have the capacity to direct credit in ways that they used to in the past. You know the industrial revolutions in East and Asia were done because there was a collaboration between public banks and commercial banks and government and it was directed through industrial policy to particular sectors and you know UNCTAD has argued that we need to be doing this now this collaboration of public banking with industrial policy for climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation but at the same time the kind of things that Maria Jose is talking about we're seeing that too that you know there's a kind of um, hijacking and you know everybody climbs on the bandwagon to push the sorts of policies that they wanted anyway and so this is also an excuse to use public banks to completely de-risk their private sector from you know their own uh, green or sustainable investments so you know it's I think it's it's incredibly interesting time and we need to be very alert to how funds are actually used and make sure that they're used for um, public benefit and not to de-risk, you know, what is it they say, public benefit and public cost and private benefit. That's what we don't want to happen here. So I think that's a, that's a very um, important point. Thank you. Okay, 
Sorry, Dan, if I just ask you to unshare the, the screen yeah. there. The um, MJ or, or Tom, did you have anything to contribute to that? Yeah, MJ? Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, I will answer on the basis of uh, your that, uh, briefing that uh, maps the response um, to the COVID-19 crisis um, uh, is specifically focused on um, uh, northern-driven and uh, northern-led uh, development finance institutions, um, including um, including DG from Germany, uh, FMO from from the Netherlands, Proparco from France, and and DFC from from the US. Um, I. I have to say that quite a lot of money, um, well, and, and the IFC from the World Bank, um, not sure whether I mentioned that. Um, I have to say that in, res in the response to COVID, quite a lot of money from um, institutions, multilateral institutions, um, has been channeled through the private um, um, or commercial um, financial sector. In, uh, in, in developing countries with the hope of reaching medium, uh, small, um, and um, um, micro, small and medium enterprises. Um, quite a lot of money have also been reached, uh, um, sorry, have also been channeled uh, through um, uh, or targeted um, the infrastructure sector, the manufacturing se sector, um, um, we don't see in our analysis of these particular five institutions a, a, a different pattern uh, in the way of, of how these institutions work on a sectoral level. Um, um, maybe the most relevant point to emphasize is the great focus on the uh, private commercial um, financial sector. Um, I think that here we have to balance these with the points included in the book um, that map the experience of national yeah. uh, <coughs> because there we might be seeing uh, something different in terms of sectors uh, with uh, particular companies uh, the, from the tourism sector, um, agribusiness or other companies heavily impacted by the COVID crisis. Thank you. Okay. I, I would just add to that the, the, the water sector thing, you know, there, the sectoral link is really important. And uh, when you look at banks, there's, for example, there's a public bank in, in the Netherlands that does nothing but finance public water. And it's been operating for 60 years. And so I think this sort of reveals the, uh, the poverty of research on public banks uh, and, and, and the, you know, what we're trying to do with our work and, and a growing literature on this, uh, understanding these sectoral links is, is really quite important. Um, now, Tom, before you go, I just we, we only have about seven minutes left, and I'm wondering if what I'll do is, is one last round of comments from our presenters. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, but did you want to, maybe you can speak, Tom, specifically to this question and then any final comments you have, and then we'll, we'll go with the other, the other two. Yeah, I'm aware, yeah, I'm aware of the time. So just as a final comment then, in terms of the question of green transition, this is a big issue for the public banks that, that I've been talking to. And really to date, they had, enormous difficulty or simply have not uh, linked COVID responses, which is really about liquidity, just about getting over the moment, the current hump, to any kind of green transition. Maybe a narrative they have, but in practice, they've been unable to do that, but they want to, and there's increasing pressure to do so. So it's really an opportunity um, to keep more on that pressure and you know to really uh, keep their, their feet to the fire on this. Uh, and you know, think about for the next next crisis that's sort of coming. Um, and yeah, I mean, in terms of the sectoral lending, really, I think sort of MG has spoken to that, but much of it has been to health, uh, much of it to general go government support, and much of it to SMEs, followed by you know some other sort of spatterings and money around. But that's those three sectors are really where, where the money has gone to. Okay. So maybe we'll just have some very brief closing comments from uh, from each of our uh, presenters and uh, and then we'll wrap it up. I haven't seen any new questions in the chat line. So um, MJ, you want to uh, leave us with some uh, final profound thoughts on public banks and COVID-19? Yeah, 
Thank you. Um, I I want to get back to the point on the Financing Common Summit um, and the agenda that these institutions have set for themselves. Um, I think that is a welcome step that these institutions are trying to uh, um, uh, claim for themselves the role that, that they have to play in the current context. I, I think that um, the, 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 the current context, as, as I mentioned before, calls for um, a greater role uh, of public institutions um, and um, in their joint uh, declaration, they put quite a lot of good intentions. And, and I think that from um, um, this group of people where we have um, uh, civil society organizations um, and also academics interested in this particular agenda, um, we should um, we, we should be paying attention to what they do with their um, with, with this work plan uh, and, and actions in the coming months and years, uh, because if not, we definitely run the risk of having a talk show um, each, each year uh, without uh, um, um, the concrete action that is needed. Um, so I, I would I would leave it like this. I think that um, this conversation. Um, uh, it's a very relevant conversation and, and we should keep engaged. Thank you. Okay, Diana? Oh, you're muted there. Yep, I'm unmuted. Um, okay, so I have two very quick related comments. Um, the first one is that, you know, what we've been talking about and discovering with the public banks is that they can scale up really quickly when they need to. And uh, private banks are not scaling up right now. It's public banks that are scaling up. And then there's often this question of, is there a trade-off between scaling up and also still maintaining their publicness? And this is an issue that many of the public banks in our book suffer because they sometimes have slightly ambiguous um, mandates and ambiguous support from their governments. And there's interesting research that shows when governments are fully supportive of their public banks, they can borrow more money on international capital markets and they can lend more developmentally without it impacting negatively on their abilities to borrow or to lend. So that's really important that governments have clear and strong support for their banks. You know, otherwise they're trying to run um, in, in pulling in different directions. Um, so that was the first thing. And then related to this, what we've seen is that in the COVID context, so just bringing this back to COVID now, is that nations and national banks alone can do a lot and they have done a lot, but you can't solve global problems at the national level. And just as coronavirus is, is contagious, well, so also is, is economic stagnation and economic recession is contagious too. And so we need to be able to solve both economic and you know, health issues with more global coordination. And I think that's been the biggest lack that we've seen so far in this, in this um, experience. It's just been massively lacking. And we used examples from the Great Depression and we used examples from um, the Marshall Plan where actually there was much more coordination than we've seen now. So ironically, we coordinate um, technically, but somehow not um, in terms of funds or cooperation when it comes to COVID. Okay, thanks. And Tom? David, actually, why don't you go ahead and, because I think uh, Subir has had to pop up, so I'll do sort of final word on thanks on behalf of uh, SOAS. So you go ahead. Okay, well, I, I'll just uh, let, remind people that the bank, uh, sorry, the book is available at um, publicbankscovid19.org along with a series of uh, smaller brief profiles. And uh, yeah, so that's all I'll say as the chair. And then Tom, I'll hand it over to you to close things up. Great. Thanks, David, for, for chairing this session. And Subir, I'm, I'm, if you've taken off, thanks for hosting it and uh, you know, this platform. And thanks to the Celeste Development Studies for this opportunity to launch this book. Um, I would also just to, for, for everyone who's joined us today, many of you I know and many of you have influenced me in the past uh, intellectually, and, but also as an academic activist. So thank you for joining me and us on this panel. Uh, and, and just to emphasize to those who are new to this topic and new to our work, the Municipal Services Project, UNCTAD, EuroDAD, uh, you know, this sort of field, it's very exciting. And, and 
because we're looking at the level of institutions and countries, as opposed to things like the World Bank and the IMF, which are really inaccessible, this is an area we can intervene. This is a struggle we can win. And it is so important to have this capacity uh, of public banks at times of crisis, but at all times. And so I would just encourage people to you know, sign on to this, this struggle in a progressive way. And it can make a significant difference uh, in, in terms of the future of, of the environment, of society, uh, of basic human relations to be able to command capacity over our public financial resources. So thank you for coming. Uh, thanks on behalf of development studies. And uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing you in the, in the future. Take care, everyone. Bye, everybody.